I want to welcome all of you and then those online that, you know, to this um, series entitled Led by the Spirit. But we, we've been using the Bible, but we also have been using this little book here entitled The Coming of the Comforter by L. E. Froom. I'm going to just tell you and, and share with you, I take the book and I just read one portion because it's too much. It is way too much. I just got to continue to to dwell upon what the Holy Spirit is telling me. So this is what it is. Counsels on health. This is what it says. The Holy Spirit seeks to abide in each soul. If, listen, that word is powerful. If it's welcome as an honored guest, those who receive it will be made complete in Christ. The good work begun will be finished. The holy thoughts, heavenly affections, and Christ-like actions will take the place of impure thoughts, perverse sentiments, and rebellious acts. Now, that goes along, and, and, and again, this this. This, um, this week, you know, the sermon has been top secret, you know. Nanette did not actually have an idea of what I, what I was going to actually preach about, all right. But I can tell you this. We're learning a lot about the Holy Spirit, right? I don't know if you're noticing, but the Holy Spirit is now challenging us to get busy in this community. Everything else opening up. There's no excuses now. We got to get busy. You see, only one say Amen. I'll say amen for you. Amen. You know, being a pastor is, very, is, is a very interesting position because it places you in very interesting situations. And today I want to discuss something very interesting from a biblical perspective, not because it is happening here at the movement. I want to, I want to clear that out. It's not happening here at the movement, but I want you to be in the lookout when it happens. Amen? So it's not happening, but I know that it will. You see, one of the requirements from God to the church is a concept of oneness. What word did I say? Oneness. See, in the beginning of the book of Acts, it says that when the disciples were in one accord, right? Oneness. But what happens or what does God do when there is not, there's no oneness between his people? What happens? I want you to go to the book of Acts chapter 6. Come on, open up your Bibles. Acts 6 and verse 1. Acts 6 and verse 1. Listen to what the Bible says. You there? All right, let's read. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples, what? Multiplied. Oh, there arose what? A what? Complaint. A complaint. Okay, stop. Stop right there. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> what arose? And this complaint happened when the church was growing. More people, more problems. More people, more attitudes. Why are you so quiet? More people in the pews, more issues between the people. Isn't that true? And I am constantly amazed as to how practical the Bible really is. The Bible is clear. As the church grew, then problems between people grew. I mean, have you ever thought about the fact that every time a person joins the movement, they are another challenge to us? Mind it, I did not say problem. I said challenge. Because now they have to fit into the mix. And some of you are still have not actually fit into the mix just yet. You come, you don't really feel that you are at home yet. You feel comfortable because, you know, we are sinners. 
receiving sinners. We actually have that clear, including me. I'm not better than you. I'm just trying to make it in. I'll say amen for you. Amen. You feel comfortable because we accept you as you are. And some of you even tell me, but Mario, I haven't found, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to fit in. And you may be asking yourself, why are you discussing this, this to this church? I mean, this doesn't happen here. I feel comfortable at the movement. We don't have that problem here, Mario. Because we're growing. And the bottom line is, the more people, the more challenges. Amen? And it is right here in the Bible, as you can see. You see that? In chapter 6, it begins like that. But the issue is, what does God do when oneness is broken? When there is no oneness between the people of the church, what does he do? Well, what does God do when a husband and a wife are not getting along? Or maybe two siblings cannot get along. Or when two neighbors are not getting along. Or when two deaconesses or deacons or elders are not getting along. Especially when all of or both of or some of the people involved call themselves Christians. Does anybody know what I'm talking about now? And I know I just lay in the foundation for you. And you all are looking at me and say, man, this is going to be a depressing sermon. No, it won't. I'm into this victory thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You see, I'm going to give you one of the best, one of the best counsels, you know, uh, uh, counseling that you can get as a Christian today. And I'm just going to, I, I just, I just laid the groundwork, but I want you to, 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 to get the setting of this verse because our subject is oneness. Oneness. Let's pray. Father, talk to us individually. In Christ's name, amen. Now, we talked a lot about, about a lot of things regarding the Holy Spirit, and I'm not going to go back through the whole list today. But overall, we talked about a lot of things that the Holy Spirit actually, how, what, what, what he does, how he works, right? All of those things. But on, on, on the New Year's sermon, we talked about how the Holy Spirit helps us live victoriously. We have that mindset of victory. Today, your question is, or should be, what is happening in this chapter to be included in the Bible? And I want to focus on something that the Holy Spirit is trying to get to happen in the church. And Christians... As Christians, we keep on resisting him. And I want to lay a seed right now in your mind. If you are a person that whenever you are in controversy with another person, sees it as their fault, you have a problem. And I'm talking from personal experience. Don't be looking around now. Keep your eyes straight. Right? Just in case you're thinking that I'm actually talking at you. No, no, this sermon is for me. Right? You know what? I didn't say that right. Let me rephrase it. If you are a person who most of the time, when you are in a controversy with other people, see it as their fault, you are the problem. I said it right that time. You are the problem. So we have arrived here at Acts chapter 6. And in order for us to understand what I just actually said, we need to understand how the Bible is structured. And remember, Acts is a historical book. So the entire book, each chapter is building on the chapter before. It starts in chapter 1, and now we land into chapter 6. And by the time you get to chapter 6, much has occurred. Because those first five chapters are amazing, right? 
Because in those first five chapters, the church has, it has almost become an unstoppable train. Going down the hill of success. Because except for the incident with Ananias and Sapphira, nothing seems to be stopping the church. Everything they touch turned to gold. And just like I mentioned in the 10 days of prayer, day number one, Satan has learned that he does not need to develop new tricks to derail human beings. He can just dress up an old trick in a new suit. Amen? And, and, and human beings will inevitably fail for the same stuff again. You know, the truth is that human beings, with all of our intellectual capacity, we have not learned about ourselves very well or very quickly. In fact, I'm going to be brave to say, if you trace your life, you're going to discover that the devil has been beating you over your head with the same stick your entire life. He never had picked up a new stick. He's saying that same old stick. Papa. I'm sorry, that's the story of my life. Maybe you're better than me, but that's the story of my life. Because what we need to realize is that the devil is an expert at studying us. I mean, why would he waste his time with new stuff when you haven't gotten over the old stuff yet? He just brings it back again and back again. And, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Everybody with me now? And this is exactly what the devil does, folks. And let me give you an example. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. I want you to use your imagination. The ears of your imagination hear birds that cannot sing a, 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 a sour note. And with your eyes of, the, uh, of your imagination, I see roses that cannot produce thorns. With the smell of your imagination, I, I, I can, uh, the air has never, uh, you know, borne any, any foul odor. I can taste fruit that has never sour. I can feel the grass under my feet that cannot produce a sharp thing that can cut my feet. A world without lions that hunt, or bees that sting, or snakes that makes one's skin crawl, because back then, snakes flew. But more than that, it is a world, use your imagination, it is a world with no controversy. Nobody argues in this world. How can you sit there so calm? Should I dare ask? Did you get through your week without any argument? I, no, 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 don't say amen. Don't say amen. Come on, come on now. She says, Sister Valentina was like, hallelujah. See what I'm saying? He's like, I didn't want you to confess. Yeah, I just want you to think about this. But this world that I'm talking about has no thieves, no liars, no argument. But even in this perfect world, the devil introduces his most successful weapon to humanity. He introduces disharmony. And this harmony is born in the incubator of doubt. Have you ever thought about that? Let me give you some examples. Go to Genesis. Come on. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go study our first parents. Genesis. Yes, Genesis. See, everything has a beginning, and you got to study that beginning so you can realize how to live victoriously. Go there with me because I want you to see how the devil, what the devil did and continues to do. I'm looking at chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Are you there? All right. Ready? Genesis 2, verse 16. This is what it says. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely what? 
Freely what? And then verse 17 starts with the word, but. Stop, stop, stop. I'm going to get technical. This is a disjunctive conjunction. I learned, you know, when I actually arrived here in the United States in high school, that, that, that when, when, I, when I came from Puerto Rico, you see, my mother makes sure that I pronounce words correctly in my native language, Spanish. So my sister and I always carry around a dictionary. But as, in, as a disjunctive conjunction, but is used to break the pattern of thought. Okay? He says, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but, keep reading, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall what? Not eat. For in the day that you what? The day that you what? Eat of it, you shall surely what? Now jump to Genesis chapter 3. Come on. Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. You know, now, God just said you can eat of all the trees, right? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Read. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat? Eat of every tree of the garden. Did you follow that? He says exactly the opposite of what God said. God just said, you, you can eat of all the trees but one. But Satan comes back and starts wincing a bit of doubt. Has God said? Which means that you really have to know what God has said. You got that? Have God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Didn't God say that? And to show you that Eve had listened to God, she actually corrects the devil in verse 2. What's this? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but... Of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you what? Touch it, lest you die. What happened after that? She does something that is very dangerous. She reveals her dissatisfaction with God's limitation by making the limitation worse than it really is. She adds words that God did not say at all. Nor shall you touch it. God didn't say that. But she's standing there looking at the tree wanting to touch it. And she's upset because she cannot touch it. Mario, I cannot dance. I can't go to the movies. I cannot wear jewelry. She has to make it worse than it is. She wants to dwell on the negative and she dares to add words to God's word. That's why Jesus says in the very last chapter of the Bible, even almost at the end of the Bible, he says, do not add any words to the, you know, to the prophecy of this book. He says it clearly. So now doubt has been planted. This harmony is birth in doubt's incubator. The woman takes the fruit, eat. There is now disharmony between God and man. And what follows is inevitable. Because disharmony between people starts with disharmony between people and God. Show me a person who cannot get along with people, and I'm going to show you a person who is not getting along with God. You see, this harmony in the church comes when people separate themselves from the Word of God, and I'm going to prove that to you in a minute. You see, you thought I was actually going to be talking about something else. No, no, no. This sermon is very simple. This is how you gain victory when dealing with other people in the church. You see, when, when you are really 
talking to Jesus and spending time with Jesus. Jesus then helps you get along with other people because he reveals to you what kind of person you really are. And when he does, you begin to learn how dare I take an attitude towards somebody else. I am a nobody. Like my young people tell me, you ain't squat. I mean, how can I get upset about somebody else's condition when my condition is either similar or worse than theirs? And this is part of our victorious thinking. If I am not perfect, how can I demand perfection from them? If I'm trying to be victorious, how can I demand victory from them? Why are we demanding of others what we are not yet? Are you with me now? So having separated themselves from the Lord, we read now in Genesis 3, verses 11 and 12, because, let's read it together, because it is inevitable that this can end any other way. But here, because they are already separated themselves from God, we, 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 we then see the results of this separation in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. Listen to what it says. It says clearly, so now you are, you know, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Look at verse 12. Then the man said, the woman. I need you to stop. No, no, no. You don't, you don't have to read anymore. You know, Adam should be, you know, should be thankful that there was no frying pans that existed in those days. And then, you know, to continue on, not only did he say the woman, he said the woman that you created. And let me tell you, he's lucky that Eve did not jump on him right there and then. Because you do know that it is believed that Adam was uh, about a ton and that, that Eve was a little bit shorter than him. She may have been a petite 1,500 pounds. So he's lucky that there was no frying pans because if there were, there would be no Adam. But the pattern now is set. And it flows through the days before the great flood. It continued through the life of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. From the descendants of Seth and Cain to the controversies between uh, the, the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot. To the strife between Jacob and Esau. God's people seem to find a reason not to get along. So here's a key statement for the entire sermon. Again, the Holy Spirit wants us to live in victory. We started that theme two weeks ago, and we, are going to, we continue on it last week. And here is what we have to watch for as, as we continue to grow. Whenever God's people get on a roll, Satan pulls out the stumbling block of disharmony. And I need you to watch for it. It's not happening now. But I, I'm telling you this right now. Satan is going to introduce it. Now, now we're going to start our, you know, that, now that we're going to start our discipleship training, guess what, folks? We're going to grow. Because God promised that my word shall not come back unto me void. But you got to watch for the hand of the devil. When things are going well, Satan will send a little ringer of this harmony. Somebody starts taking an attitude. I, I, and it may not be you. Maybe they had a rough week. I, you know, even the nicest person in the world can actually turn mean in a day. Don't be looking around. Oh, here. And, and this is a person that is usually nice, and suddenly, what in the world just happened to you? And this is the, the, it is this thing that Satan has developed over the years, all right? And he plants it in you. Adam said, the woman. 
Satan plants, it, 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 it's, you know, Satan plants in us questions about another person's intentions. You know, somebody said something that, that, that you don't like, and you said they were trying to embarrass me. Well, they probably were not trying to embarrass you at all. They probably just have a loose mouth. Some people don't know what to say. Stop looking around. Some folks have no idea what to say. They always get their foot in their mouth all the way down to their stomach. They're not ill-intentioned, but because we are insecure, because we are not sure of ourselves. Did I just say we? Yes, I did. We. Because we are not as close to Jesus as we ought to be, because we have not found out that he loved you so much. I found that out a long time ago. My Jesus loves me. But because we have not passed the point where you consistently need somebody to just stroke you to make you feel good. When somebody says something we don't like, we built a Mount Everest out of a, out of a molehill. We get all bent out of shape. So the pattern has started. Jacob's sons could not get along. And then their descendants, the 12 tribes of Israel, have you read about them in the Bible? They could not get along. <laughs> so why would Satan try anything different by the time we get to the book of Acts chapter 6? It is now the first century AD. And Satan had thousands of years of success. So why would he try something new? The church is baptizing. People are having a great time. Satan says, you know what? I know how to fix this. I'll get the Greeks to complain against the Jews. Because <laughs> you see, Satan even had success before the church started with the founders of the church. Go to Luke 22. Come on. Go, 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 go. Let's do this. Go. Yeah, Luke. Luke 22. Yeah. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Yeah. Uh-huh. Luke 22. See, <laughs> Satan is not changing. Satan already probed the leaders of the church and found that he could have success with them too. Luke 22, uh, verse, verse 24. Yep, yeah, yeah, I'm there. I'm there. Are you there? All right. You see, th this, this right here is an ugly church right here. Watch this. It says what? In verse 24. Now there was also a what? A strife or dispute among them. As to which of them should be considered what? Greatest. The greatest? That's a ridiculous discussion that is going on here. Because by the time we get to chapter 6 of the book of Acts, Satan recalls his insertion into the leaders of the church. Wealth, and folks, he has precision. Well-timed disharmony derail the 12 disciples so they could not be what they should have been at the crucifixion. More than that, they could not fulfill the mission. Friends, the sermon is not a general sermon. It is a very specific point. They got distracted from the mission. They wasted their witnessing opportunity from the time that Christ was arrested, past the resurrection. They just spent their time running, hiding, uh, denying, believing. And Satan's plan almost worked. I said almost. How do I know that? Because when Jesus finds them again, they have gone back to fishing. They were not winning any souls. They forgot completely that Jesus said, I will make you fishers of man. No, no, no. They have gone back to what they were, they, they were to where they were before they found Jesus. 
Folks, this is the plan of Satan. He wants us to go back to the place we were before Jesus gave us the truth. Satan wants us, like Peter says in 2 Peter, Satan wants us to go back to the vomit. Are you following me? But the disharmony amongst them so affected them that they failed Christ during the crucifixion. And when Jesus finds them, again, they are fishing. They're just fishing now. Regular fish. Not for man like he called them to do. And friends, the ultimate purpose of this harmony in the church is not to get you and me not to get along. It's to keep you and me from doing God's work. And again, it's not happening here. But as we grow, you got to be watching. Now you got the purpose of the sermon. You thought I was going to actually beat you upside the head. No. No, no, no. We need to deal with this, uh, you know, for us to be vigilant as we enter into this discipleship training on February 4th, that training phase, and we see God's blessing. But uh, 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 that is the purpose of this sermon. Everything else is just going to be a repeat. The devil causes confusion amongst God's people so we don't work. So then even we pastors and elders and members, rather of us doing what Peter say, ministry and the word, we spend time putting out fires among God's people. And this is not happening in this church, but people come to church because they've been in other churches that this has taken place, and they're tentative. Oh, they cannot be that perfect. I'm just waiting for the day they're going to mess up. The movement cannot be that good. Some of us are waiting for something to happen. Hasn't happened, but you are just tentative. You're looking from the outside. Something's going on here. And we are wasting our energy trying to get this person to get along with that person on the phone, crying, talking about what they said. They even remember details. They remember how their face frowned. They won't look at me, pastor. When did that happen? Oh, 25 years ago. And Satan, you know what he does? He just sits back and laughs. <laughs> they still remember that stuff. <laughs> Meanwhile, the ministry is not getting done. People are not being visited. Hospital, people that are in the hospital, they're not getting a visitation. Are you listening to what I'm saying here? That literature will not be distributed. No souls are getting baptized if the members are fighting. And I'm just telling you because my mother used to say, in a forewarned war, no people die. So when you see the hand of the devil, I'm talking about victory. Just get on your knees and pray. But you have to do something also. So looking back at the fast-moving train of the early church, 3,000 souls were baptized in Acts chapter 2. 5,000 added in Acts chapter 4. A multitude is added in Acts chapter 5. But these are the words in chapter 2 that made the devil tremble. Go to Acts chapter 2. Come on. <laughs> oh, I love Jesus. He is a genius. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to highlight some of the things that happened in Acts chapter 2 that got the, got the devil worried. All right? Look, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. You there? Here we go. Read. Then those who gladly receive his word were what? These are some key words that come out of these verses. Gladly received. In verse 42, you find that they continue in the apostles' what? Doctrines and fellowship. 
You see that church? Man, this is good stuff. Then you see in verse 44, if you keep going down, and, the, and all that believe were what? Together. Uh, and they also had all things in common. Wow. And then in verse 45, it says, it, 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 this is the key text, by the way, because it connects you to verse 1 of Acts chapter 6. Because it says that they sold their possessions and their goods and divided it amongst them as they needed it. Can you see that church? Huh? And then in verse 46, they continue daily in what? One accord. Continue daily in oneness. And the text finishes with simplicity of heart. Well, when Satan saw everything that was happening, he had to make a move. Because Satan knows that a church that is not unified will turn, I'm sorry, a church that is unified will turn the world upside down. People getting along like that, they become believable. You see, you can talk about the Sabbath, the law, the diet, the chocolates, the, 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 the veggie links, the carrot juice, until your face turns blue. Because if you cannot get along, you're not going to baptize anybody. I mean, think of, come on, folks. Let, let, this, is, this is just an intimate conversation. They already laugh at our religious, our religious beliefs. Huh? All this stuff that we believe. Oh, the Sabbath and the diet and the tithing. All that stuff has not brought you to the foundation of being a Christian. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the foundation. You see, people don't want to hear about the day that you keep. People are looking today for real Christians. I said, people are looking today for real Christians. Christians that live a certain lifestyle. The lifestyle that God has instructed us to live. So Satan made a move. Now go back to verse, verse, verse 45 of chapter 2. Listen to what it says. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, that seemed to suggest that things were going very well on the ministration. But something happened in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. You see, all I'm trying to get you to see is how the Bible ties together. The Bible is always setting you up for the next thing to come. Verse 45 says that they divided their things. All are receiving it. No hint of any complaint. But from between chapter 2 and chapter 6, the devil got busy. You see, somebody on the distribution committee said, Jews first, Greeks last. So let's bring it to us. Let me ask you the question I have asked myself the entire week. What kind of insidious little stuff do you do sometimes to create disharmony? You see, <laughs> see every time I'm writing a sermon, I have to do a self-assessment. All right? I, I, and again, I have to be honest with myself about this, folks. I got to be honest with myself. Sometimes it's just the little simple sentences that I say. She's very nice. But, just planting the seed. Oh, she seems so lovely. I wish they wouldn't use her that much, but she seems lovely. She's so nice. Of course, sometimes she's just too sensitive. Oh, no, 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 yeah, no, he makes great money. In fact, he drives a nice car. Man, sometimes he's a little arrogant. 
the little stuff. Are you the kind of person that has difficulty in giving another person full credit? Oh, we got those little zingers. I used to be like that, by the way. That's why I know what I'm talking about here. And what I had to realize, what I had to realize here is that those zingers is an advertisement of my insecurity. And so, so we have Greeks complaining against the, about the Hebrews. And the snake has crawled up the tree again. And as once he did to place doubts on his mind about God's intentions, he is now placing doubt in the Greek Christian mind about the intentions of the Jewish Christians. And this harmony is now sticking his ugly head again, sticking out his ugly his ugly head. And we have, you know, we have to go deeper now, though, because I have been spending the time about uh, this time about about what the devil does. But that's not how I started the sermon. The question that I started with is, what does God do when this people, when His people are not in oneness? Well, in order to find out, we got to know a little bit about the mission of the church. Let's look at a few texts from the book of John. Trust me, folks. If we learn this, there's nobody going to stop us. Gospel of John, what does the Lord do? To find out, we need to talk about the mission of the church. John 3.16, I know you can say it verbatim, but be humble. (laughs) John 3.16, all right, here it goes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. One of the things that I have noticed about the Lord is that the Lord stays very mission focused. You see, God doesn't let the devil distract him. The devil is always testing God's nature. Huh? You do know that if I was God, the devil would not exist. Yeah, yeah. With, with the type of military training that I have, I would have taken him out a long time ago. I'm confessing. But God never lets anybody distract him from his mission to love and save. John 4, 34. John 4, verse 34. This is what it says. Jesus talking. Jesus said to them, My food and my food is to do the will of him who sent me and do what? Finish his work. Focus. Jesus said, I'm here for that purpose. God so loved that he gave. Gave me to do what? To finish the work. John 6, John 6, come on. John 6, verse 38. Listen to what it says. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of who? Him who sent me. You see, that's focus. With all the distractions Satan sent Jesus' way, harassing him and sending mean people his way, And notice, 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 notice. Jesus seldom got himself involved in controversies or arguments with people. He just kept his mind in focus. If we can get the movement to stay focused on the mission, it will frustrate the devil. He will stop messing with our relationships. He will say, I have, le- I have to leave them alone because they're so focused. They don't have time to waste their, 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 their energies on each other in controversy. They are fighting me. Folks, fight the devil. 
I'll say amen for you. Amen. Fight the devil. Why are you so scared of saying that? Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, alone I cannot fight the devil, but with Jesus? Don't fight each other. Fight the devil. John 10.10. 10. John 10.10. 10. Folks, you, you got to read all of this here. John 10.10. 10. And then John continues. Yeah, the, sons of th the son of thunder. Uh, John 10.10. 10. Notice, we, we, the, the focus never changes for God. Read John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have what? Life, and that they may have it, what? More abundantly. So at the end of his ministry, Jesus met with his disciples and made it clear what he expected of them. And he does it in a very unforgettable setting. They are in the Sea of Galilee, huh? fishing. And when Jesus called them, he said to them, I have called you to be fishers of men. You remember that, right? Yeah. But here, when he comes back, resurrection, fishing for fish, controversy got them off their, off their mission. Who's going to be the greatest? <laughs> all right? All messed up. And the Bible says something very interesting when you actually, it says that they were fishing in John 21, and they caught nothing. Lesson clear. Listen, when the church gets off its mission, it produces nothing. But the question is still saying, what does God do when the church is not in oneness? Well, in Acts 6, Satan strikes again, brings his harmony. And I need you to listen because this is amazing. This harmony among believers does more than produce confusion. It produces paralysis. Let, let, let's see, let, you know, let, let me take it from the perspective of marriage. When you and your spouse are not getting along, the whole family is paralyzed. You know couples, you know how we are, we're funny. Have you ever noticed how much energy it takes not to speak to any, somebody else? For days, walking, walking past each other. Same house, same bills, same mortgage, and you're not talking to each other. Isn't that dumb? Come on, let's say it together. That's dumb. Say it. That's dumb. All right? Because it takes a whole lot of energy because you got to walk by him or her. We married men, we have to walk by them. Huh? And you have to look the other way. But you sleep in the same bed, probably using the same closet in the master bedroom. So now you got to go to Home Depot, buy a temporary closet to put your clothes. Not talking to each other. Imagine you come to church and you're mad at a member and you try to avoid them. You can try to avoid them all you want. But at some point, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will make sure that you see that person. Amen? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know, I know that doesn't happen here at the movement. But it can happen if we do not fight the devil. I told you this was a sermon about victory. We need to fight the devil. But, but there are people who decide, you know what, I'm just going to avoid them. But the Holy Spirit is not buying that. He makes sure that they walk past you. They never sit in that pew, but today he'll, they'll sit there. Paralysis. You see, Satan's goal is more than just getting people in the church not to speak to one another, become suspicious of one another, become critical of one another, or even not care, caring for one another. But that is the superficial success. Because what Satan is after is to halt the work of God. 
I want you to read this statement. Everybody. From the book Acts of the Apostles, page 87 and 88. I want you to read this with me. All right? Watch this. Victory. Watch. The hearts of those. Come on, read. The hearts of those who have been converted over under the labors of the apostles were softened and what? United by Christian love. Despite former prejudices, all were what? In harmony with one another. Satan knew that so long as this what? Union continued to exist, he would be what? Come on! Union makes the devil what? Powerless. So when the church is together, the devil has no power in these pews. Somebody ought to say amen. You crippled the devil. Now, if you forget everything that I said today, just remember this. When we are getting along in this church and working together, the devil cannot do a thing with us. He can now do a thing with your marriage. He cannot do a thing with your family. Why? You are getting along. But what does God do when there's no oneness? You see, Peter figured it out in Acts 6 and verse 2. Peter, go there. Acts 6. Real quick. Come on, hurry up. I'm hungry. Acts 6, verse 2. Listen to what Peter said. He said, hey, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God. Now, I'm going to tell you what you need to do when there is controversy. When there is controversy, don't leave the word of God. Don't stop praying. Don't stop being nice to yourself. Peter said, we don't have time for this. In other words, I can hear Peter saying, we cannot stop the mission to set our arguments. So what is God's solution? Acts 6 and verse 3. All right? Listen to what it says. Come on, folks. What is God's solution when there's no oneness? Well, it took me long enough to get here. You might as well just read it. It says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Did you get it? What's going on here? Listen, listen, listen. listen. What, what does God do? When the church is not getting along, God calls, it, God, God call is to get back to work. Get back to the mission. Get busy. Involve more people. Now let me tell you why the, the movement is not yet the church that it can be. We are very good compared to other churches around us. And we are working. Now, 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 we are, now we are through the pandemic, we are working to get involved with our discipleship program. But the reason why this church is not the church it can be yet is because we still have too few people carrying the load in this church. That's why Nanette didn't even know that I was going to preach about this. And she's passing out this paper. And I'm baffled. Last night, I, I, I wanted to say something. I said, like, no, no, keep it quiet, keep it quiet, keep it quiet, keep it quiet, keep it quiet. I wanted to tell them about the whole sermon. But the, 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 the Lord said to Peter, distribute the load. Distribute the load. That's, that's why Nines is, is asking, hey, I, I need you to be a greeter. I need you to do the kneeling prayer. I need you to please participate in the tithes and offerings. I need you to be back there in the media, with the media folks. Get involved in Sabbath school. Get involved in the children's Sabbath school. Get involved. But here is where the ingenious of God is seen. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at the names of the people. You know, sometimes I come out of my study with my head just shaking. With a big smile on my face. Because while I'm preparing or even doing my own personal Bible study, the Lord shows me something, you know? You know how it is, right? You've been reading this text for 30 years, and all of a sudden it's like, bam! 
That's what happened to me. Acts 6 and verse 5, look at the ingenious of God. And the saying pleased the multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Did you see that last name? Nicholas? What do you think he was? A Greek. He was a Greek. So God answers the confusion amongst people in a very simple way. Let the people who were complaining get to work. And no, no. In fact, three of them are Greeks. So God picked the complainers. God is saying, if you don't like what's going on at the movement, shut your mouth and go to work. Don't keep arguing. Roll up your sleeves, volunteer, do something. The Lord said the devil got them confused arguing amongst themselves. I'm going to take those arguing the loudest and give them responsibility. Isn't God amazing? This is the, the, how genius God is. Do not allow this problem in the movement. Don't come here and just sit in a pew. Because when you sit in a pew, all you can do is look. And when you look, all you do is see. And when you see, all you do is criticize. And for that not to happen, all of us have to get up and get busy. Work. Get involved. Join the ministry. Take up something because when you do, something amazing happens. You want to see it? <laughs> Verse 7. Look at what happened when we get involved. It says, clearly, then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied. How? Greatly. Greatly. See, folks, God is a genius. What does God do when people are not getting along? He pulls in the complainers. And he says, stop talking and complaining and get to work. But let me bring it to us now. See, you're not getting along with your spouse. Do your end. You do the loving. Just one amen. Man, pastor, you were doing good, but now it's getting tough. You just, you just have lost your mind. You read your Bible too many times this week. But this is the concept from God. You do the loving. You do the kindness. If someone in the church won't speak to you, you speak to them. You reach out, Mario, but they're mean to me. It's okay. Do your part. You did what God asked you to do. Let judgment fall on them, not on you, because you will not do what God, God have asked you to do. What does God do when he sees his church not getting along? He needs people to get back to work. What, do God, you know, what does God need people to do, particularly the complainers? Get back to work. You don't like what's happening? Get involved. I tell my young people, we will support you in anything you, you can set up. Don't ask me to set it up. I don't have time. But if you set it up, we'll be behind you. Get to work. You got to let your talents, your skills, and every single one of us have them. Your feelings, your ideas, make things better. And when you do that, in the movement, there is union. There is oneness. And where there is union or oneness amongst God's people, we are told that Satan is what? Powerless. And I'm going to tell you from personal experience. 
as I close this sermon, I want to talk about the most important disharmony. Listen, because God is about to make his appeal. Folks, I need you to really concentrate on this one. And I am telling you all this today because I love you. You have poured out your love towards me and, and towards my family and towards Nanette for the past 10 weeks after my surgery. And for that, we appreciate you. Today, we have to talk about this harmony between you and God. Listen. We said that it produces this harmony between you and the people. But for many of us, our worst disharmony is the inner disharmony. Some of us don't even like ourselves. I know, I've been there. There are things we have done in our past, we cannot just seem to get over it. We will not forgive ourselves. And what I want you to realize is that some of the things that you cannot forgive yourself for, God has blotted it out of your books years ago. But you're still beating yourself over something that does not exist in heaven. It tears up my heart when I see Christians in this kind of condition. God blotted it out. You need to blot it out. Stop treating yourself like you're still that old sinner. The inner disharmony, fear of failure, fear of being laughed at, fear of not being loved, that inner disharmony, that's your worst disharmony. And it keeps you from doing God, what God wants you to do. I know, trust me, I know. You know, you look at Annette and I and working, busy, calling. You want to know why we do it? Because we don't, we, we, we don't want this harmony in our lives. See, we were told about what God does when, when there's not oneness in the church and how to become one in him at the beginning of, of my Christian walk. And we, and we said to ourselves, this is not only what we want to do in the church, but we believe that this is what God wanted us to do inside our home. It is the only way that God can take an alcoholic, womanizer, partier, and turn, it in, tur turn him into an evangelist or even a pastor. It's the only way that God can take a smoker and turn her into a singing evangelist and an instrument for our young people. It's the only way. So God is calling all of us as we continue to set the set of sermons of thinking victoriously by being led by the Spirit, God is calling us to leave our past, our mistakes where they belong in the past. Behind us. And the best way for us not to think about those things is by getting involved in the work of Jesus. What is it? To seek and to save those who are lost. I told you before, and I'm going to repeat it again. I didn't join the army because I'm a patriot. My first instinct for joining the army is because I thought that I was more, I, I was worth more dead than alive. I was in a suicide mission. All because of my mistakes. All because of my mother's death. So I'm wondering today if there's anyone here who would like to say to Jesus, no more internal disharmony, Lord. No more beating myself upside my head because of the things that I have done. No more allowing the devil to remind me of my mistakes. You have taken care of my mistakes the minute I came to the foot of the cross. 
I'm done living in disharmony, Lord. I resolve to live knowing that you have taken care of my past. So I wonder, is anybody here that would like to do the same today? Say to your past, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to allow that to be the past. I'm going to be victorious in Jesus Christ our Lord from this minute on. I resolve to be in heaven. So I wonder if you want that. If that's your decision. I wonder if you can join me here in this altar so we can pray together. Who will come? Yes. Take those steps. Jesus is waiting. Father in heaven, we built this group of people, this group of believers under your direction, under your dream of having a church that could accept anybody as they are. But as we grow, we know. <laughs> we know, Lord, that the devil is going to try to get in. So today, Lord, today we make this resolution with you. And Lord, we are not going to allow the devil to come in. That we will be in oneness so we can render the devil powerless. But Father, we have come before this altar saying no more. No more. No more will the devil, the great accuser, is going to keep on reminding me of the things that I have done. We all have stood up with this mindset that we are victorious in Jesus Christ our Lord. So Father, right now, as we took those steps, I can see that transaction taking place in heaven. And everything is blotted out. Amen. Everything is gone so let it not be any more disharmony in our, inside ourselves. Let the past be the past. Let us live in victory from here on out. Knowing, Lord, that if somebody even reminds us of what we have done, we can literally say, get thee behind me. Because my Jesus has taken care of that. So, Father, right now, bless everyone that has actually come close, that have come forward. Lord, always bring to their mind, don't worry about the past. It's done. Think about a future with me in heaven. A place where there will be no more crying. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more sickness. Because we will be with you forever. And that's where we're going. From this day forward, from this minute, that's where we resolve to be and where we resolve to be. So Father, bless everyone. Guide them, lead them. And I ask all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen. and amen.